afternoon. I'd like to welcome again and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy, Executive Director of the Institute for Global Health and John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine, who answers your COVID questions every Tuesday and Thursday here on our Facebook page. And we invite you to continue to submit your questions to us via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or directly via email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. And leading the discussion again today is Katie Berg, who is an intern this summer with the Institute. And Katie, I now turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kristen. And thank you so much to all of the viewers who continue to submit questions. We really appreciate it. And of course, thank you to Dr. Murphy for taking your time out and answering these questions. We're gonna to start today looking at some of the headlines that have come across lately. and. One question that's been coming up a lot is, are COVID deaths increasing with the COVID cases we're seeing across the country? We still don't know. Uh, it's the same question uh, that we've answered before. There's two things going on, basically. Um, one is that we've taken basically half the population pretty much out of the equation. Uh, that is the vaccinated people. and. In the United States, the older you are, the more likely you are to be vaccinated. So that group is kind of out. So what you have left is just everybody else, including younger people, more younger people are not vaccinated. Uh, and so, uh, of course, the, the kind of bad results are going to be skewed towards that group that's unvaccinated. And so, you know, under 18, very few people are vaccinated. Uh, so, you know, that's that's one thing that's going, but there does seem to be um, more pediatric cases uh, than they saw originally um, in the pandemic before the vaccines uh, existed. So there's uh, there's evidence uh, that maybe this is a, it is a uh, more difficult uh, variant uh, and causes more disease, uh, particularly in younger people, uh, but it's incremental. It's, it's, it's not a massive increase. Um, and uh, uh, the number of actual hospitalizations and deaths in children uh, is still low. However, you look in Texas and in uh, Louisiana and Florida, uh, states which have a challenging problem right now, uh, the pediatric units are really hitting their uh, maximum capacity. So something very strange, unfortunately, is going on, uh, and uh, it's not going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely very troubling to hear. Um, this is a little bit strange because, as we know, the U.S. has a lot of COVID cases right now. But do you know if there are any updates on the opening of the U.S. borders and travel restrictions for foreigners visiting the U.S.? Well, um, there is a movement uh, uh, worldwide to uh, only allow vaccinated people to travel internationally um, to get into a country. Canada doing the same. Europe uh, is the same. And now the United States is stepping forward also. These are for non-residents, non-citizens, that uh, if they want to come here, they've got to be vaccinated and have a uh, positive, um, uh, and have a, a negative, excuse me, not a positive, but have a negative test result also, uh, in addition to being vaccinated. So this is going to be the norm for international travel. Mm -hmm. Right. And do you anticipate any other federal mask or vaccine regulations or mandates in this country? Well, the, uh, the United States, of course, the feds can't mandate uh, to the states. The states really control the, um, you know, all the, the health care in, uh, in their particular states. However, the feds can control things in federal buildings uh, and uh, particularly with the military, you know, which is the largest employer in the United States. Uh, if you look at it from uh, that angle, they are in the process now of mandating vaccines for all military personnel. So that's 2.4 million people, I believe. Uh, and uh, that is going to be September 15th, or as soon as the full approval of the vaccine uh, is received, whatever comes first. Wow, that is really big news. And do you expect to see proof of vaccination requirements uh, locally or maybe all over the country, like we've seen in countries like France? 
Uh, so in France now, uh, all indoor dining and in your in, indoor venues, uh, you have to show proof of vaccination. It's causing a big uproar in France. Uh, France is, uh, has a big anti-vaccine crowd too. Uh, here it's uh, done piecemeal. Uh, so the companies are doing it themselves. Uh, restaurants and employers are doing it themselves. So uh, the employers mandating vaccines, Tyson Food is doing it. Uh, Google, uh, you know, a lot of the big companies uh, are uh, mandating uh, that the employees uh, get vaccinated before they come to the office. Um, that is likely going to go company by company, business by business. Uh, as I said, I don't, the, the feds can't, ma cannot mandate that. It's not in their, the, their regulatory realm. Uh, that could be done by the states, however. Mm -hmm. Wow. And now moving on to some of our viewer submitted questions for the week. Our first question comes from a viewer who received their second dose of the Pfizer vaccine in early April, but unfortunately that same day came down with COVID symptoms uh, separate from the vaccine side effects. A mm -hmm. few days later, they visited their physician for a COVID test and it was positive. So are there any negative effects to receiving your second dose of the vaccine while you have an active COVID infection? And if there are, should they seek out an additional Dose. Yeah, uh, the recommendation really is not to give a vaccine while you're having an active COVID infection uh, and that people have been waiting uh, a period of time, 10 days to two weeks after all their symptoms have resolved. Uh, some people wait even up to three months because getting COVID is like getting a vaccine, sort of. So, um, you know, you should just wait until all your symptoms are calmed down and then go in for the second shot. Mm -hmm. And we have another really great question from another viewer, and that is, are vaccinated individuals more likely to produce vaccine-resistant variants? No, they're, they're not more likely. Uh, but just the more people with COVID who have virus that's replicating in them, the ch more chances there are for a mutant uh, to develop, for another variant to develop. So they just fall into that pool with everybody else that, uh, you know, they, because with the Delta, unfortunately, the uh, viral replication in the vaccinated and unvaccinated is approximately the same. So the risk is the same for developing uh, a variant of concern. Very interesting. Another viewer has two children, one five-year-old and one one-year-old. Obviously, they cannot get vaccinated yet, and the youngest can't even wear a mask fully. Um, is it safe for vaccinated grandparents or other vaccinated friends or family to visit in their home without masks? Well, this is, there's no right or wrong on this one. So the thing is with the visiting grandparents in particular, they're elderly, uh, if any of them have a severe underlying condition, it would not be good to be around the kids or to maintain social distancing and wearing a mask when you're around them, uh, especially the, the ones not wearing the mask. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. If everybody's relatively healthy and not too old, not, you know, if they're under 65, uh, for example, uh, the risk is going to be very low. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a personal decision that they have to make. But, uh, you know, the kids aren't any, being around any unvaccinated person, child or adult, pretty much now indoors, you should be wearing a mask and practicing social distancing. Mm -hmm. And then another question in a similar vein, another viewer was vaccinated, but recently recovered from a breakthrough infection of COVID, uh, mm -hmm. presumably the Delta variant. And they're wondering if they're now completely immune to Delta and if they can attend large gatherings. Well, you know, someone who's been fully vaccinated and then has a breakthrough infection, that's like getting a, like another booster shot. Uh, I don't think uh, I would feel safe uh, in uh, saying that that person, you know, is completely immune and doesn't have to wear a mask anymore. I think they should follow all the rules that we have set up, all the guidelines, I should say, they're not really rules. Uh, and that, uh, you know, when they're indoors with a, a group of mixed people, vaccinated and unvaccinated, uh, they should be wearing masks and socially distancing. So uh, it, the, the same, it's really basically the same rules. You can have multiple breakthrough infections. Uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, but that's the case. Just remember, you know, you still, you have 90% protection with the vaccine. Uh, there's these 10% for whatever reason breakthrough. We don't know why. Mm -hmm. And our final question today comes from a viewer 
who we've had a lot of confusion around this topic, but they have a friend who has argued that in children specifically, the flu has been more dangerous than COVID-19. And they were wondering if that's true. Yeah, well, um, last year, because of all the mitigations that were in place, there was hardly any flu in adults or kids. So this year with kids back to school and some wearing masks and some not, and some states, uh, anti uh, mitigation efforts, whatever, it's a whole mixed bag. We expect to see a lot more flu uh, this year. If you look at um, uh, the risk for kids with flu, the, the highest risk is people less than five years of age. All right. And the, the pre-COVID era, the 2018-19, 434 kids under five died from the flu. All right. As the kids get older, they have the death rate goes down. Now with COVID, it's kind of the opposite. This year, the CDC reported actually on August 4th, just the last week, uh, that the death rate, um, the number of deaths, not the rate, but the number of deaths uh, in the zero to four range was 128 cases. So that's less than the, the flu from pre-pandemic periods. Um, however, the difference is in the five to 18 group that uh, there were 288 deaths so far in kids five to 18. So it's higher in the older kids and lower in the younger kids for, for COVID. And uh, this is a mixture of Delta and non-Delta uh, variants. Wow, that's certainly very, very interesting. And I look forward to hearing more data about that as- well, you'll be seeing more that for sure. This is being looked at very closely. Yes, and thank you so much, Dr. Murphy, for your time. We really appreciate it. And thank you to all of our viewers for submitting questions. If you have any, please feel free to submit them. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you.